So let me begin with a basic question. Who is Ayn Rand? She was born Elisa Rosenbaum in Petrograd, Russia in 1905. And when she was 12 years old, she lived through the Russian Revolution. And here I'd like to read the first selection from my book. It's the opening uh, paragraph which describes um, her experience at that time. It was a wintry day in 1918 when the Red Guard pounded on the door of Zinovi Rosenbaum's chemistry shop. The guards bore a seal of the state of Russia, which they nailed upon the door, signaling that it had been seized in the name of the people. Zinovi could at least be thankful the mad whirl of revolution had taken only his property and not his life. But his eldest daughter, Elisa, 12 at the time, burned with indignation. This shop was her father's. He had worked for it, studied long hours at university, dispensed valued advice and medicines to his customers. Now in an instant it was gone, taken to benefit nameless, faceless peasants, strangers who could offer her father nothing in return. The soldiers had come in boots, carrying guns, making clear that resistance would mean death. Yet they had spoken the language of fairness and equality, their goal to build a better society for all. Watching, listening, absorbing, Elisa knew one thing for certain. Those who invoked such lofty ideals were not to be trusted. Talk about helping others was only a thin cover for force and power. It was a lesson she would never forget. Now, over the next 10 years, after this moment when her family lost their primary livelihood, um, they struggled to eke out a living among the privations of life in revolutionary Russia. And by the time she reached her early 20s, Elisa had had enough. She knew she had to get out of there. So she convinced her family to make contact with some uh, relatives living in Chicago, and she convinced them to sponsor her for a visit to the United States, which she knew would be permanent. So I'm going to read now uh, an excerpt describing her passage out of Russia. Elisa's impending departure made the entire family tense. At each bureaucratic hurdle, Elisa was struck with panic attacks at the prospect she might not escape. Even as they urged her to use any means necessary to stay in the United States, the Rosenbaums were devastated by her departure. Elisa appeared more sanguine. Going to America was like, quote, going to Mars, end quote, and she knew she might never see her family again. Yet she was supremely confident about her own prospects, and she also shared her father's sense that the communist government could not last. Quote, I'll be famous by the time I return, end quote, she shouted to her stricken family as the train pulled out of the Leningrad station in January 1926. Aside from the lovelorn Serioza, who would accompany her as far as Moscow, Elisa was on her own. She carried with her 17 film scenarios and a precious stone sewn into her clothes by Anna. Nora, Natasha, and her cousins chased after the train as it faded into the distance. Zinovi returned home and wept. Leaving Russia was only the first step, for Elisa still had to receive immigration papers from the American consulate in neighboring Latvia. Just a year earlier, responding to rising nativist sentiment, the U.S. Congress had moved to severely restrict immigration from Russia and other Eastern European nations. As she waited for her appointment, staying with family friends, Elisa soothed her nerves at the cinema, seeing four films during her brief stay. A quick fib about a fiancé secured her the necessary American papers, and then she was off, taking a train through Berlin and Paris, and then she, uh, where more family connections smoothed her way. At The Hague, she sent a last cable to Leningrad and then took passage on an ocean liner bound for New York. Once there, she would be met by yet more family friends who would shepherd her to Chicago. On board the De Grasse, Elisa was flattened by seasickness, but as she lay pinned to her berth by the motion of the sea, she began refashioning herself. In Russia, she had experimented with using a different surname, Rand, an abbreviation of Rosenbaum. Now she jettisoned Elisa for a given name inspired by a Finnish writer. Like a Hollywood star, she wanted a new, streamlined name that would be memorable on the marquee. The one she ultimately chose, Ayn Rand, 
freed her from her gender, her religion, her past. It was the perfect name for a child of destiny. So the tale from then on is extraordinary, and I'll fast forward uh, through it, but she uh, goes from Chicago to Hollywood, where she has a chance encounter with the famous director, Cecil B. DeMille. She talks him into giving her her first job, uh, marries a dashing uh, young actor, Frank O'Connor, and uh, meets an early uh, success as both a playwright and a screenwriter. And it's in 1943 that she first achieves uh, lasting fame with her second novel, The Fountainhead. And though The Fountainhead is typically understood as a story of an individualistic architect who refuses to compromise his designs or his ideas um, for popularity, it's also a parable about uh, expanded government and the dangers of collectivism in the time of Roosevelt. And as I describe in my book, over the 12 year period she was working on the Fountainhead, Rand had a political awakening of sorts. And so when the book was published, it was received by political conservatives as an attack upon Roosevelt, which it was in a, uh, in a very veiled way. So this first book of hers was the start of her relationship or her importance or her prestige on the political right. But this relationship was never without its tensions, primarily because of her atheism. So I want to, uh, fast forwarding now to the early 50s, and describe her first encounter with uh, William F. Buckley Jr., one of the most uh, famous conservatives of his time, and, and even still today. <laughs> 